Jessica, I'm so thrilled to talk to you. How are you? I'm doing very well, Stephanie. Thank you very much. How about you? I'm great. I always love to talk to designers because I have no <laughs> skills in this department. Why don't we start our chat today by you telling us who you are, what you do, and how you found yourself interested in interior design? Well, um, like you said, Jessica Velasquez. I'm from Panama, actually. I'm originally from Panama. I live in Canada, and I'm a mom of five. I am an interior designer who loved rearranging things around her bedroom since she was 12. So I navigated naturally into interior design, you know, right after graduating from high school. I have been, you know, fluctuated from interior design to real estate, depending on where I've been, because I've moved from Panama to Canada and back to Canada and Panama several times. So I've done different things. Um, but lately in my probably last six years, I've dedicated solely to interior design and I've actually talked a lot to first time homeowners as well, because I find this is a sec section of the population that is neglected. Their budget is not as robust as it is for people who are upgrading or even downsizing and they still need to have a place where they feel taken care of and supported. Hmm. Well, when you wrote to me, you mentioned how you have the concept of evergreen rooms as a design target that homeowners should strive for. What is an evergreen room and what are their benefits? Um, I'll mention quickly the other targets so you, you have some, some idea. Um, and the reason why I created this target is because most of my clients, um, they are not confident in design decisions. And th that doesn't mean they're not good at it. It just means that they're probably not as confident in making decisions on their own. So I created departure point and I created targets, design targets. So the three are cohesiveness or rooms are cohesive, rooms that reflect their personality and rooms that are evergreen. And evergreen is, if, if we go to the normal term, evergreen is, it's a plan that will stand through the seasons. And when we talk about an evergreen room is one that will stand through trends and seasons, one that will not expire next year because Something new came up and the new colors, Pantone, you know, they, they, all of these com painting companies just issue their new colors of the year. And then all of a sudden your room has expired. So an evergreen room will stand the test and will not uh, grow old or, or let me say that again. So evergreen rooms will stand the test of time and will not expire, like I said, just because everything else in the world is changing or being updated. Hmm. Well, I'm sure most of my listeners who are tuning in today are on board with the concept of evergreen rooms, right? We don't want to continuously head to Home Goods or Crate and Barrel or the or whatever the home decor store is that we prefer to buy the next thing to update our decor. Uh, however, I feel as though evergreen rooms or minimalist decor fall, uh, can fall into a trap, which is white walls that are devoid of personality. Can you speak more to that? Are, are evergreen rooms always white walls without personality or not? Yeah, not at all. So let, let me just go to the basics here an evergreen room will not expire but that doesn't mean that it's neutral or boring or not even minimalist because anyone could create an evergreen room whether they're minimalist or not i think the key here is what kind of homeowner are you are you the type of homeowner that will get bored with the colors and the accent pieces in a year or two and by bored it doesn't mean that that it was the wrong choice it just means that you are a person that likes to refresh the room more frequently than others. 
Others would love a room and, you know, the, the, the pieces they selected, everything, and will stay there for years. I'm saying five, seven years. I find that most people like to give the room a space, a refresh. The key here then is if you are that type of homeowner, you don't want to be spending, let's just say every year, you don't want to be spending an astronomical amount to change everything in the room. You just want to give it a refresh, just change a few things, maybe recycle the the decorations that you have and the pillows that you have in your living room, bring them to your bedroom or the ones in your family room, you know, switch them to your living room. That's about recycling. So the key here is identifying what type of homeowner you are and then identifying or dividing your choices between the predominant pieces of furniture and the accent pieces. The predominant pieces being the the piece of furniture that is the biggest one in the room, the one that catches your attention the quickest, like your couches or your dining set, built-ins, your headboard. Those are usually where your eye turns to go first when you walk into these rooms. Those pieces, you want to keep them neutral and classic. And I by classic, I don't mean they have to necessarily be traditional lines you know, like antique. No, it just means that there are lines, the lines of the furniture, the style, the colors can go with anything. So if I buy my headboard that doesn't need to be white, it could actually be black. It could be gray. It could be cream beige. But those colors will allow me to bring in my bedding that could be blue, And then I would bring in artwork that has some blue and whites. But next year, or maybe in a year and a half, I want to change it. I want to refresh it. I don't need to change the head, the the headboard. All I need to change is my bedding, a few pillows. And if I played it right, maybe not even my artwork, just a few pieces. So my suggestion is to start with the smaller pieces, the ones that are the least expensive to change, and see how that feels. But bring in, but if if you play it right, whatever you bring into your room, those predominant pieces, even the artwork will go with a lot of different colors. Okay, Jessica, you're rocking my world right now. I must say, you've just taught me something that I probably should have learned before purchasing a home and decorating it. What I hear you saying is that the big stuff the focal points in a room, the dining room table, the couch, uh, I don't know, the, yeah, the headboard, the kitchen table, the big stuff should be, they, they should, you shouldn't make some bold choices with those big pieces. Is that correct? That is correct. If you are that type of person that doesn't want to invest or be changing things, you know, your listeners are like to, to buy pieces that are more the quality instead of, you know, like the smaller pieces here that will will probably be more trending, then just choose the ones. Your, your biggest investment should go towards those pieces that will go with everything. That would be evergreen. And then just change the, the smaller items. Like, for example, artwork. You want to buy quality artwork, then make sure that that one piece it's usually a larger one, usually, will go with different colors. So if you if you buy, let's say, an oil painting and it's it's just based on blues and grays, I'm sure it would look beautiful with a lot of different colors. But what if that one painting had other colors, maybe some greens, maybe some browns, some ochres, some yellows, then all of a sudden it opens up your choices, your windows of opportunities are so many more that you can pull from those colors and accessorize. And your investment in that painting will stay evergreen for years to come. I love that. Okay, so I learned something big there. Thank you so much, Jessica. But you also argue too that it's important to identify the perhaps problem areas or the tricky areas to style before you ever buy a single thing. And as a minimalist who's also frugal, I need to know more about this because 
I don't want to waste money and I don't think my listeners do either. So how do you identify and solve those potential problem areas before buying? There are several potential problems. And when I, I've been to homeowners, uh, to homes, and the homeowner will say, help me, um, a simple example, help me refresh my entrance. Help me make it look like it's me who lives there, here. Um, help, let me say that again. I go to a house and I talk to the homeowner and they ask, help me refresh my entrance. Help me style it in a way that tells who I am, my style, my personality. And I look around and I see problems. I see shoes on the floor, jackets that don't have a place where to be put or hung. I see furniture that is oversized or, or that is not placed correctly. So those are problem areas. Those are issues that need to be addressed first. Because in reality, I could go in and change the colors and install wallpaper, change the lighting, you name it. But if those problems are not addressed first, nothing will change that. It could be beautiful on the outside, but in the inside, that entrance, as small as it could be, is crying for solutions. And by solutions, I mean, for example, families need storage solutions. The, our dynamics will tell you, will tell us, what is it that we need to support that lifestyle? So if you have small children, you want to place baskets, for example, for their gloves and their toques. And, and, and I'm saying gloves and toques because I live in Canada. And in Canada... The, tr the custom is to take your shoes off at the entrance. So everybody that comes in leaves the shoes at the entrance. Guests as well as family members. And you come into the homes and you see shoes everywhere. Even if it's not from guests, just your family. So you can imagine winter boots, wet shoes, right? So those, those shoes need a solution. They need some kind of system for that. So if, because otherwise, you're going to have a beautiful styled entrance but you can have shoes everywhere. Or you can go into a living room. It's the same thing. If you know you have kids and, and your kids play and you want to have a home that it's livable, not a home where you tell your kids, don't sit here, don't go here, don't play here. You know, a, a house is to be lived in. A, we should be in a house that supports us, not the other way around. So if you have children and they have toys and they leave them around, provide solutions for that. Maybe choose uh, double duty furniture, like an ottoman that has storage, um, cabinets that where you can put basket for toys or school supplies. But those solutions need to be provided before anything, any decor is brought into the room. The size of the furniture is another one that needs to be addressed, uh, how that furniture is placed. Another thing that needs to be addressed is the message you are sending with the placement of your furniture. If you want to highlight your view, then your furniture should be placed accordingly. If you are a family that watches TV from, you know, when you're dining, when you're eating, then the TV and the dining room should be placed accordingly and vice versa. If you don't want to highlight the TV, if that's not the center of your family, don't make it the center of attention. So those are just a few problems that need to be addressed before anything is purchased. What I love about your answer there, Jessica, is that you argue to you argue that it's important to solve the problems before you take out your wallet and before you buy a single thing. I think a lot of times with home decor, with fashion, with anything in life, our first impulse in a consumerist society is always to open the wallet and buy the solution. But what I hear you saying is that buying should not be step one. Buying should go way down the line in the steps associated with making an evergreen room. And I would agree with that. I, As sustainable minimalists, my listeners are sustainable minimalists, they hear me say all the time that buying is a last resort and they're probably rolling their eyes as I'm saying it again. But a solution doesn't have to come from a store. You mentioned the entryway and shoes all over the place. You know, my kids 
the solution to their shoes is they each have an oversized bin for their shoes. The bins weren't purchased. The bins came from my basement. They were repurposed. It doesn't always have to be um, an expensive, let's go out of the home to find the solution solution. Would you agree with that? I totally agree with that. First of all, um, like you said, buy should be the last thing. I believe thoroughly that, or I believe strongly that there needs to be a needs assessment before and a lot of self-awareness. When we understand the type of family we are, how we want to live, the vision that we have for our family, the the solutions and, and even the decisions to purchase something or not become so much easier because you've arrived to that place of self-awareness. Self-awareness also includes your budget. And I find that sometimes as consumers, we're letting the prices and the sales offers determine our style, determine what we bring in. And that becomes very restrictive. So yes, buying should be the very last thing we do. And I do believe that we should recycle what we have in our homes and just look around. And sometimes we have a lot of things that we're not being, we're not using and we're keeping for the sake of, oh, what if I need it? Or this reminds, this is something my grandma gave me. And those things they can be used if they are precious and they they have some sentimental value to you bring them out and use them in your home instead of going out to buy you know artwork or some prints bring what you love what you have already stored in your home out and decorate your home with the things that are personal to you the things that mean something to you I think you use the term needs assessment. We need to do a needs assessment before we buy anything. And as you said that, I chuckled to myself because even though you're right, even though we all need to do that needs assessment, that introspection before we buy something, like needs assessments are not fun, <laughs> right? But going to stores and perusing online and buying stuff, that is fun. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you have any words of encouragement for people who are like, oh, I don't want to do a needs assessment? Any thoughts? <laughs> I do. I do. Um, maybe let me put it this way. If you were to hire an interior designer, the interior designer will do that for you. They would actually research with you in, in, on a personal interview through a lot of questions about your family. They would say things like, tell me about your family. How old are your kids? Uh, let's just say we're redesigning the living dining room. And they will ask questions like, how do you use this space? Do you have guests? Do you host parties? And how do you like to cater or do you like to cook? So you can imagine the line of questions. So this needs assessment is part of every designer's job. Designers don't go out, they, they're not hired, and the first thing they do is go out to buy. Buying is the fun thing. Buying is the sexy, the sexiest part of interior design, but it is not the first one, and it is not the most time-consuming one. The most time-consuming one is understanding how this family works in this space and determining how this space can better serve them, not the other way around. So my word of advice or to answer your question is, if that is how professional designers do it, then that's how we as regular homeowners should be doing it for ourselves. And that is the best way to save money as well. I'm, I'm sure that, that you probably know people that have bought furniture and they come back and say, oh, I, I, don't, like, I don't like how it looks or it doesn't fit in my space. Or it really, it's, it's not working for us. So if you, we want to avoid returning items or accumulating things that we actually don't need, that needs assessment, as boring as it sounds, needs to happen. Well, you just gave me a lot of encouragement for the next time I design a space. I must say, interior hiring an interior designer has never previously been in 
my family's budget. However, I love to hear that you start with that needs assessment because it tells me that whether I'm working with a professional or not, I can't skip that step. I know I personally, as I'm listening to you talk, all the design mistakes that I've purchased are coming to my mind. Our couch is a big one. Uh, you know, we had it. I don't know if customs the word, but we made it to order. And so when it came and it wasn't right, we were actually genuinely and woefully stuck with it. And so if we had done that needs assessment first, we would have saved ourselves from making a many thousand dollar mistake. So thank you for that. Now let's transition our conversation back into those evergreen rooms. So we are ready to perhaps design. We've done our needs assessment. We know what to do with the staple pieces we're buying or otherwise acquiring, buying or otherwise acquiring timeless pieces. Now, what do we do with the rest of the room? What do we do with the walls? What do we do with the accent pieces so that it's timeless and not trendy? Very good. Um, so like you said, you have your room, you have your predominant pieces that will go with everything or mostly everything. Now it's time to bring in the accent pieces. And accent pieces could be, I'm, I'm going to bring it down from the most expensive ones to the least expensive ones. Okay, so the most expensive ones being cabinets and chairs. Um, you go down the list, you know, area rugs, artwork, coffee tables, any accent tables. You go down one level and you're probably talking about drapes, not custom drapes, just your store-bought custom drapes. Uh, sorry, store-bought drapes. Um, pillows, vases table lamps, you know, the, the small pieces of accessories. So the more comfortable you feel with, let me put this again, say this again, the more cut, the more comfortable you feel updating, then the more you can go up or the higher the tier you can go. So if you want to refresh a room and change all the accent pieces, then you want to make sure that those bigger ones in this category, like accent chairs and cabinets and that can be changed without, without changing everything else. But if we are not comfortable investing and you just want to give it a quick refresh, maybe, maybe just for the next season, you know, it's summertime and you want to just bring brighter colors into your room, then make sure that your smaller pieces are the ones that need to be changed only. So if, to give you a clear example, uh, in my bedroom, I may have winter colors, you know, a little bit darker, more texture, and I just want to give it a quick refresh. All I need to change is probably my pillows and my throw blanket, if I have any. Or if I want to go one more tier, I can just change the pillows, the throw blanket, and maybe the vases and the decorations. And then, and then you keep going up one more tier, depending on budget and how comfortable you feel. But if you're not, if you don't want to invest a lot of money in changing the bigger pieces, then make sure that the smaller ones are the ones that need to be changed. And therefore, those cabinets, those accent chairs will also need to be not necessarily completely neutral, but in colors that can be interchanged in rooms and with other colors. A clear example for um, that I can give is Teals. Teals are very, it's a beautiful color, but it's not one that you could probably use in many different situations or many different colors. So if you if you love teal, don't buy the accent chairs in teal if you don't want to invest in that and changing them in a year or two. Bring in teal in your pillows, in your rug, and in your artwork or in your vases and your table lamps. We just have to be strategically, but I want to bring attention to the fact that I'm talking about a self-awareness too. As homeowners, we need to be very self-aware. Where I'm at in this spectrum, where, where, what is my budget, my ideal budget? Do I want to be investing or do I feel comfortable, you know, investing a little bit more every so often or not? And that, that kind of self-awareness will tell you what to bring in and what to change when you want to refresh. Does that, does that answer the question? 
It absolutely answers my question. And for those of us listening who are frugal by nature, perhaps we don't want to spend a lot of money updating our spaces. I What I hear you saying is we start with the cheap stuff or the inexpensive stuff, I should say. We start with maybe switching pillows out from another room or perhaps switching out that artwork, perhaps taking some trinkets, some vases, some lanterns, some other tchotchkes and moving them around. Maybe we buy new, maybe we head to the thrift store. That makes complete sense to me, right? If we if we're sick of a room, we're not if we're sick of our dining room, we're not going to just go out and buy a new dining room table. We're going to start with the smaller things first and that might do the trick. <laughs> For Yes, absolutely. I have used I have a few predominant pieces of artwork that are large enough. And that's another uh, advice. When you buy artwork, you either buy larger pieces of paintings or if you if you like your walls more fully decorated, make sure that your, your frames, your artwork, together, collectively, create the, the visual image of a larger one. So that, that's one thing. That's a piece of advice. Now, Back to my point, I do have a few artwork pieces that are large. I'm talking three by four, two and a half by by three and a half. And I change those throughout my home. I may get tired of using this one right by my entrance and I switch it to my living room and I've switched it to my bedroom and then I just switch the pillows. And like you said, the smaller pieces of accessories, like maybe the table lamp or a vase or a bowl, but bringing the colors, you want to pull the colors from your artwork. That artwork is an essential decor element. It becomes a focal point. And when it does, if you pull the colors from the artwork and you bring it in, you sprinkle those colors in the smaller pieces of accessories, you have a winning strategy. So if you have an artwork, uh, a painting that has greens and ochres and browns, then pull those greens and pull those ochre colors, buy some pillowcases. You don't have to buy the pillow. You can just buy the cover and just keep the insert. So buy the cover in those yellows and ochres and browns and bring in maybe a couple of bowls or maybe maybe you have wood uh, accessories that are made out of, you know, this earthy organic materials and all of a sudden you have that winning combination and then if you if you feel that ne- the next color you want to update you know in the next season is the the monochromatic one then you you take out the yellows the the, the mustardy ochre colors and then you bring more of the cream colors but that one painting will serve the purpose for the for two or three combinations and all you need it to do was change the covers and a few accessories without investing in a new piece of artwork or new furniture. That speaks to me as somebody who <laughs> loves her home and wants her home to be beautiful and doesn't want to spend a lot of money. But then my question becomes, Jessica, do all my rooms have to have the same color palette? Not at all. If you come to my home, my my bedroom is it has some blues and my living room has some grays and blacks and, and ochres. I, I, I mentioned ochre and the mustardy color. I love it. And in my dining room, I have some teals and greens. And so I don't have the same colors, but I do exchange the pieces that, and sometimes I do buy an, so, uh, new ones. I have a blue wall here in my office with prints, but that blue will go well with the blues in my bedroom, which would go well with some of the grays in my living room. So it's just a matter of looking into what you have and being creative that, and just kind of seeing where things can fit from what you have without necessarily having to go and and splurge on something new. And I don't find uh, completely wrong if you want to bring in a new color, because that will also give a refresh. But the point with an evergreen room is that you don't have to change everything. If you play it right, your most expensive quality pieces will stay evergreen for the throughout the seasons and you can just update and update without having to spend more money well that's a 
perfect place to leave it, but I'm not going to leave it because I'm speaking with somebody <laughs> so knowledgeable. And I just have a, one more question for you. Again, this is a personal question that I've always wanted an answer to. So I'm going to ask it. And that has to do with the color of the walls, the color we paint our walls. I know that changing a paint color is a relatively inexpensive update. However, I do find that it's a extremely annoying and uh, time consuming and life upending update. I'm talking moving furniture, covering furniture, having professional painters perhaps come in and change the color of the walls. And so for anybody who's, if I have anybody who's listening right now, who's painting walls, what should they consider when choosing that color? Are you going to say choose a boring white or not? I don't find white boring, first of all. I find white as the perfect canvas for anything because you can update that. You can accessorize and bring that room with so many things. So the white will give you a perfect canvas. However, um, I do love a good feature wall. Wallpapering a bedroom or the living room dining area might be beautiful to some people, but if your listeners will choose to do that, they just have to be very careful that that one wallpaper they will choose, which will be very expensive to wallpaper the whole area, will be able to be matched with so many different uh, decor elements throughout the years. So... That's a very bold um, move. Painting the whole room or the whole area in a bold color is also <laughs> bold, and forgive me using the same word. Um, so what you want to do is just bring in color in the feature wall. If you want to bring in texture and style, just do the one feature wall. And and what wall to do? Probably the that your focal where your focal point is, where you want to just bring in the attention to. So choose a color that will bring in your style and your personality if you're doing a feature wall and it won't be as expensive as doing the whole area but if you do choose to do the whole area that one wallpaper or color should be one that you can use throughout seasons and in several years some people may feel oh i can paint every year but not everybody likes to do that and not everybody likes wants to pay for the cost of doing that. So be smart and just do one feature wall and let that wall tell your style and talk about your personality. And then make sure again that if you're choosing a wallpaper for that one feature wall, you're still sprinkling the colors and the wallpaper through the room with the use of smaller accessories. I, I do have a group where, you know, it's called pins to reality. And in that group, my, my uh, participants have questions. So they ask the questions and we just go through exactly where you're saying. Um, the questions that you have are very, very valid questions for everyone. And, and just the, the validity and the confidence of making those decisions are part of, of trying things out and asking and experimenting and making sure that you have that winning combination, that winning strategy from the beginning so you don't regret and you don't have the buyer's remorse at the end. That It's very, very common. But I, I think with the points that I've shared, people will be able to just make decisions along the way with more confidence. But if there's something I can say to your listeners is to be intentional in, in your decisions. I find that a lot of times that lack of confidence that I just mentioned will keep people from making decisions and living in rooms that are bare. And, and by bare, I don't mean, I don't want to, I don't want to say boring or neutral. I want to talk about the, the personality of the room itself. So I find that that lack of confidence, that fear of making mistakes that fear of spending more money, you know, all those beliefs will keep people from taking one step. We're afraid to make mistakes. We're afraid to waste money. Meanwhile, that room, that home is not 
it's not creating anything for you. It's not inspiring. And our homes need to, they need to be that. They need to be that place where we feel hugged and taken care of. Our home should be setting us up for success, not just as a person, but as a family. So my advice, if anything anyone takes from this conversation is be intentional and take one step. You change the corner, change the wall and notice the impact that that will have on your life. That I know for sure that will motivate everyone to take one more step and do one more wall. And perhaps you do the whole room, but we need to get to that place where we're we're confident and we know, okay, th- this is really, really filling my soul and it's brightening up my days. It's making me feel that I want to invite people over. I, my kids are happy. They're playing. They're, they, they're feeling that this house is happy for them too. Then, then that has to be enough to motivate us to make changes with intention in our homes. Just gave me a lot of motivation to <laughs> look at my home with a more critical eye. So I want to thank you so much for coming on the show, Jessica. Tell us where we can find more of you and your services online. Thanks for asking. They can find me at my website, Interiors by Jessica. And uh, I, I'm also on Instagram, Interiors underscore by underscore Jessica. I do a lot of uh, lives and I have fun on Instagram, basically. But if you go to my website, you can find my services. You can find the group that I mentioned. And I also have some freebies, like some guides on how to decorate and accessorize uh, with a cohesive look in mind, which is the the strategy that I was telling you of sprinkling the colors and free guides to do that self-awareness assessment. I also have a free uh, guide that talks about the the four powers of a self-care home. So all that is on my website and they're free resources. I do want to motivate people and empower them with the tools to, like I said, take their home with intention to the next level. Well, I just followed you on Instagram and I so look forward to continuing to follow your work and gleaning your wisdom. So thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate you giving us your time. Thank you, Stephanie. It was an honor.